Well, good evening and welcome to today's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Quentin Hardy. I'm the head of editorial at Google Cloud, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for tonight's program. Joining us is Malcolm Nance, a retired intelligence officer and author of the new book, The Plot to Destroy Democracy, How Putin and His Spies Are Undermining America and Dismantling the West. Not much to worry about there. Um, <laughs> let me set the stage a bit by reflecting on some current events to talk a bit about what I think you've done with this book. Last week, the Senate Intelligence Committee released a report that supported the view of three different U.S. intelligence agencies that Russia tried to help Donald Trump win the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Senator Mark Warner, the Democratic vice chairman of the committee, said, the Russian effort was extensive and sophisticated, and its goals were to undermine public faith in the democratic process, to hurt Senate Secretary Clinton, and to help Donald Trump. Now, if you missed this news, it's no big surprise. It received relatively little attention possibly because it was released on the eve of the July 4th holiday for some reason. And it might also have been because the conclusions and the action, there was no call to action to speak of, it was oddly thin against the magnitude of the charge. A foreign adversary had effectively attacked the centerpiece of our democracy. Mm -hmm. This may be, it may be that this shocking behavior is now the worst thing that can apparently exist in our public discourse. It was old news as if only the latest and most novel outrages matter anymore in our high-velocity information world. Or perhaps we could retre retreat to complacent cynicism. Well, there are enemies. What do you expect? Or finding other easy conclusions. Of course they did it. Putin hates Clinton. Old news again. Or they were testing out the cyber. They wanted to make us cynical about democracy. That's good for authoritarians. It's something he does. Let's just move on. Our guest tonight does not want to move on. He wants to go deeper. And his book, <laughs> The Plot to Destroy Democracy, posits what the senators affirmed. Russia interfered with our election. And it's only a much part of a much longer and more pervasive attack being waged on the West, and in particular on the United States. He takes us through the history of Russian disinformation campaigns, Putin's close associates, and their ruthless philosophies of power, their new method of hybrid warfare that Russia has been developing for over a decade, and the employment of witting and unwitting act actors in the West, including the, the right-wing nationalist movements across Europe, and quite possibly our president. A former intelligence agent, he builds his case in the, much the way a national security analyst would, with a combination of history, methods, motives, facts, and likely suppositions. And when he puts all of the fragmented stories we've heard about Russia's behavior in one place, the conclusion becomes compelling enough to make at least one reader wonder how bad a corner we might be in. Well, thank you for that, Malcolm Nance. <laughs> You're welcome. Don't read it in the daytime. Oh, no. nighttime. Let, let's start a little bit with your intelligence background, because sure. I think it really is key for the kind of book you've written here. Sure. Talk a little bit about what you did in, in the defense intelligence. Well, uh, I came from the naval intelligence world, in, in, in particular cryptology. And this is where I get a lot of flack, for those of you who probably see me on MSNBC. You know, people say, well, you're an Arabic interpreter. You're an Arabic uh, linguist. You know, you're the guy who puts the headphones on and, as we say in our business, does something. And... <laughs> <laughs> which everyone who knows what I do now goes, oh, yeah, I know exactly what yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. So, Scary guy. you know, we go out, we do some things, and we collect information to keep you safe. And I did that for 20 years, uh, and I spent my entire time in the Middle East, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So people naturally go, well, why are you writing these books about Russia? Well, I, I was born in the Cold War. I was raised in the Cold War, and I started my career deep in the Cold War. And back in those days, there was this nefarious organization who was our opposition in the intelligence world known as the KGB. And the KGB, for you young kids, uh, is this organization, this Russian intelligence organization now, that was all-encompassing, a Soviet intelligence organization. They were Soviet communist. And I find that I really do have to explain that to people. Because some people say, well, wait a minute, the KGB ceased to exist 25 years ago. No, when the Soviet Union transitioned into a fledgling democracy and a consumer economy and a, what is now a very hard-right conservative uh, country, they just changed the letters of KGB to FSB, 
and you know broke off some of the the the, the, the duties of the, that organization. And but, many of the habits of disinformation and propaganda were just pulled over wholesale. Well, I mean, all you had to do was put it on new print paper with a header on it that said FSB, right? Yeah. All that stuff still exists. It is, it is uh, the, 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 the keys and the treasures of Russian intelligence. But for those of us who are a, of a certain age, we all remember the KGB as being this global organization that infiltrated everywhere and carried out operations. I was part of that world. Even though I worked in the Middle East, the KGB was really everywhere. Yeah. Go to Naples, Italy, and they would warn you. The KGB and their subordinates and their contractors would try to entrap you in, you know, in sexual dalliances or some drug-related activity. You go to Naples, there they are, you know, trying to sell you drugs in the men's room. You go to Port Said, which was an Egyptian company, country that was backed by the Russians for decades. Mm -hmm. There they would be. Uh, Libyan working the mission in Libya, right. backed Libyan intelligence, backed by KGB. Iraqi intelligence, backed by KGB. They were everywhere. They were ubiquitous. And the time you're working, Putin, yeah. Putin's in East Germany as a KGB agent. When at that time, Vladimir Putin was running human agents into West Germany to steal computer technology and to try to you know, convert people to the Soviet ideology. So the Cold War is not that far behind us to where this was a requirement for everyone in intelligence to know what these people were doing. And in my world, I ran into them so much. I mean, we ran into their operations. We collected against them. The Soviet armed forces were constantly in our face. You really had to know who the, you know, the strategic adversary of the United States was. Then it collapsed. And when it collapsed, people thought, well, this is a new day in Russia, and what we'll get is a fledgling democracy, which for a short period of time we did have. But their intelligence activities never changed. Their armed forces collapsed, but their, their people out in the field, still trying to recruit human agents, still trying to use signals intelligence against the United States. It diminished a bit, but then Vladimir Putin, the former KGB officer, who would later become the first director of Russian intelligence, of the FSB, uh, took over and became the leader of Russia. And that would be like making me president, right? <laughs> because at that point, you start thinking, hey, I really had fun mm -hmm. when I was in operations, right? And so, you know, you sit down in the Oval Office and you go, I want to know every clandestine mission going on in the world today. <clears throat> well, that's Vladimir Putin. But the difference is he could operationalize everything he had learned in the KGB, and then everything that the KGB never completed, he was now in a position to bring that into the Russian Federation and to carry out his strategy. And the strategy you describe is reflected in everything from supporting the likes of right-wing nationalist parties across Europe, um, recruiting <clears throat> kleptocrat businessmen in Russia to go forth into the West and co-opt people. Um, cyber invasions or cyber warfare in Georgia or in Ukraine and military activity in Ukraine. Is this a grand methodical plan or opportunistic behavior? I think it started as opportunistic behavior. You have to understand, this, is a, this was a, a, a hardcore Soviet follower. I mean, he, he, he believed in the mission of the KGB. There's a, there's a, there's a story uh, by Masha Gessen, who wrote his, his, his biography, where as a young kid, I think he was like 12 or 13 years old, he went to an open house of the KGB, and he said, I want to be a KGB officer. And of course, they laughed at him. And he said, well, how do I do it? And they said, go to school, study hard, go to university, get a degree in law, and then come back and apply. That's exactly Checked what all he the boxes. did. Yeah. And he was recruited, became a middle-level officer in Europe, and that's where he carried out his activities. But then his world crashed around him. But you have to understand, Russia did not, you know, the Soviet Union disappeared as a, as a political organization. But Russians didn't change. The only thing that changed is they now had access to goods from the West, they could make money, and everything there that would belong to the collective, which was everything from coffee cups, you know, to orchids, belonged to the state. 
If Vladimir Putin's job when he returned to St. Petersburg was to help liquidate that state, which meant steal whatever, cash it out, sell it to people in the West, take your illicit billions, and then go buy apartments in Monaco and Baden-Baden in New York City. I would argue, reading your books, you think something did change, though, which is there was created some disillusionment with what the Soviet Union had been, but an enormous resentment for the victory dance the West was carrying out, as if now Russia should become a capitalist yeah, state. You're absolutely right. A lot of people, you remember when the Soviet Union fell, they had the mini coup d'etat where they were trying to right. take back, the, you know, these, these older hardcore Soviets were trying to take back the government from Yeltsin. And then later on, when that, that all failed and we saw Russia started having newspapers, television channels, were really big consumers of the West, you know, people started thinking they were becoming a, fled, a real fledgling democracy. And what they were becoming was confused hmm. because they have their own beliefs. They had, prior to the Soviet Union, centuries of, of, of being led by these autocrats. And in fact, Tsar Nicholas I had a national motto of orthodoxy with the Russian Orthodoxy Church, orthodoxy, nationalism, autocracy. And that was a relatively good guiding principle that, of course, was, you know, literally killed by the Soviet Union. It transposes uh, very well to a number of the right-wing sure, movements he's supporting in Putin, Europe and the U.S. Yeah, but Putin was developing his own belief of how should this new country that he was now taking charge of, how should it develop? What is it? What is their identity? And I think he found a lot of comfort in, uh, in Tsar Nicholas's motto. But I think he added another factor because many people in, in Russia were getting insanely rich, insanely rich. And anyone who would go along with, with Putin and Yeltsin at that time could keep their money. But when he became president, he realized he had to be a real strongman leader. And anyone who crossed him, the easiest thing to do was to act like the Soviets. You nationalize their assets, you seize them, and you had other oligarchs, super rich, buy them out and get rid of them to the point where no one was making real, you know, billions in Russia without his say-so. Right. But more importantly, he made sure that every oligarch had a KGB or FSB uh, officer on their staff. He almost, it's almost as if he jailed Kordakovsky to show he, one outlier what would happen. Well, he absolutely did and seized all of his assets. Yeah. I mean, and everyone else got the message. This is how he took over the city of St. Petersburg when he was up and coming. How did he bring, he brought the mafia under control by promising them their cut. And when they did, got out of line, he used FSB or KGB assets to bring them into line. And the Russians back, they knew who the KGB were. Even if you're a mafioso, you know that you were going to disappear, end up in a furnace, or turn into a millstone. So, literally, <laughs> those were the That's punishments. That's your choices. Um, so, there is this person in this historical situation with these antecedents. Let's sharpen the focus. Sure. What has he been doing in the West, specifically in the U.S., into 2016, and you believe now, right? Yeah. Well, I think that they found their footing, and they found their footing in the early 2000s when Putin realized that he believed in, and everyone there believed in orthodoxy, nationalism, autocracy, and he added oligarchy. And he wasn't going to be Peter the Great. He was not going to be bringing the West to Russia. His philosophers and friends realized that Russia needed to make itself great again, right? And to do that, <laughs> if that sounds familiar... Yeah. It, Hats available at the gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't an original phrase, and neither is draining the swamp, uh, which came from a philosopher of Putin's, Alexander Dugin. But Putin realized that, and to also realized they could actually achieve a strategic goal with, by being part of the consumer world and having modern technology at their fingertips that they could never have achieved under the Soviet Union, which is make Russia a strategic competitor on equal, on par with the United States, even though they have the gross domestic product of Italy, 
Right. Right. Russia is not a rich nation. It's a nation rich in three things, oil and gas, atomic bombs and the sale of weapons. And so how do you do that? Well, it's simple. You bring the West down and you step on them and you use them to propel yourself up. But back in the old days, and again, I have to go back to the, to the Soviet Union, they viewed the West as corrupt deity that was holding back the world. And so for him, he realized the West was like the Soviet, it was like Russia, fundamentally conservative, or at least that's what he saw it as, and that Russia were conservatives, and now orthodox conservatives. And so they started using the methodologies of Russian intelligence to identify who their allies in the West would, could be that would naturally support them. Well, into this scenario, the near or effective collapse of the world financial system in 2008 and the miserization of millions of people who see this amorphous international force committing this failure and receiving no punishment plays perfectly absolutely. into where he wants to go. You're, you're absolutely right. And you see that the, the, the collapse of the global markets, which took a lot of their money, but you also have a nation that one, the average person in Russia, other than that they could now buy Nutella, okay, didn't really improve. No. You know, I've had, you know, I haven't been to Russia. Uh, I have family members that have and are from there. And they say it's essentially a trailer park with atomic bombs. Now, I know a lot of people will contend with that. But for the average Russian, things did not change other than the fact they could get Toyota Corollas and not Lattice. But in the West, it was devastating. But in the West, it was devastating. But Russia itself had to, you know, you have to understand, they would see this global transformation and say, how can we capitalize on that? That's a spy's way of thinking, right? right? How can we use this? And they say, look at who are out there. Who could be our natural allies? And it was the European, initially the European conservative parties. And many of those parties were untouchable. I mean, you know, the, 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 the Austrian Freedom Party, created in 1952 by two ex-Nazis who had served in World War II. Golden Dawn in Greece. That's right, Golden Dan Dawn Hillary. in Greece. All these organizations that were fascist, conservative, but on the borderline neo-Nazi, if not open Nazi. These groups, unlike the way the Soviet Union backed the leftist West and terrorist groups like, you know, Red Army Faction and Action Direct in France, they saw the conservative movement as closer to them ideologically, and they started funding these organizations. And Europe, conservatism in Europe right now is fundamentally bought and paid for by Moscow. Marine Le Pen, who, who went against... A million dollar loan. Uh, actually, 50 million euros. Pardon me. And, uh, you know... Um, there's, a, there's a joke after she lost the French elections last year where her job, she said very clearly she is aligned with Putin and her job was to break up the European Union and get France out of NATO. So one person being backed by Moscow could literally upend 50% of everything that occurred since the end of World War II. All of which is a preamble to 2016 here. Right. So what happens there? What happens there is... A and who is Donald Trump in all this? <laughs> you know, I know that there's been some recent reporting where people assert that, you know, Donald Trump was co-opted in the 80s and turned into a Russian asset. But a lot of people don't use these terms of art correctly. I think very early on, when Russia was liquidating all those billions and hiding their money in real estate all around the world, that Donald Trump became a useful idiot. And now you, you think back to the Soviet Union terms, it was those guys who believed in the ideology. No, a useful idiot is a person who will do things that benefit you because it benefits them and they don't care what your ideology is. And selling real estate to Russians around New York City and Florida was, was, was their benefit. If they're pathologically incurious, that's a positive. That's right, absolutely. Not just incurious. Uh, uh, Yuri Bezmenov, the intelligence officer who talked about the target of KGB recruitment, was always a narcissist who was insatiable in terms of greed. And now I'm not saying that that was a framework. 
But surprisingly, <laughs> someone fit that mold.、Mm. And those kind of people you monitor. And we found that as far back as the early 1980s, Czech intelligence, the Czech Repub- what is now the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakian、uh, intelligence for the KGB, had been monitoring Donald Trump, who was married to Ivanka Trump, and had been sending back regular reports. And they are now on the internet. Those reports. But over time, Donald Trump pl- was interested in. Doing business with Russia, which he saw, I guess, as this bastion of you know future money, natural resources, grand hotels, and hot chicks, and all of that would come to be true.、Hmm. So, in some ways, this is worse than no collusion. In a way, <laughs> it's it's it, no. You're you're positing that there's a kind of that. Putin created this environment, abetted by Manafort, who had worked in Ukraine on pro-Putin cases, and you know was funded by an oligarch. Came to the states and created, in effect, Trump's base, and then Steve Bannon supercharges it, and Trump thinks he created Trump's base, and he adores getting cheered by Trump's base. Yeah, but you're really you're really saying this was created by Russians. I don't think that he, they created his base. I think they co-opted his base. Okay. And let me again step back a, just a little bit into history, just about ten years or so. While Russia was finding its footing as the, a center of conservatism、mm-hmm. in the East,、uh, you, you might recall that a lot of people, certainly once Barack Obama was elected, and you know, in、uh, in two thousand eight, were saying that Russia. Was more of a Christian conservative nation than the United States. There are politicians on record who have said Vladimir Putin is a stronger leader than Barack Obama will ever be, and they saw the election of Barack Obama as this cultural anathema, a breakdown which they saw on par with electing Osama bin Laden as president of the United States. And I literally have had people say that to me that he was no better than Osama bin Laden with regards. To running the United States, when you have a mindset like that, it's very hard to get a person crowbarred out of that mindset. And so the Russians saw this, but like all good James Bond villains, they also saw that having this enormous pool of insane amounts of money could buy anyone. And if you recall back to those old films, all right, you know Hans Ernest Blofeld. You know he had a giant million dollars. Yes,、yeah, so、a million dollars, right? He had a giant billion, you know, million dollar yacht. He had, you know,、uh, bikini clad women everywhere. He controlled the global undergrounds and all of those things. It's ridiculous, but the, the Russian oligarchy literally reflects that character.、Mm. And that money was going everywhere, and it had created a global elite that were spending money wildly around the world. And anyone who was anyone wanted to be part of that scene, wanted to go to Ibiza with sixty-five-year-old guys and hang out on a hundred-million-dollar yacht, right? And so, with that, you saw American conservatives saw their money and their strength of an autocratic leader, and. Putin's own fixings, where he made the image that he was now the protector of the Russian Orthodox Church, right? Because when he became director of FSB, the first thing he did was renovate the church next door to their headquarters and torture center on Lubyanka Square. And so, American conservatives, starting with the fringe, started seeing Russia as a center of Christian of Christian conservatism, and then. Russia started feeding them that image, and starting with organizations like the National Organization of Marriage, an extremist group that was listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group, and they started carrying out a co-option where they were using American hatred of Islam on the extreme right as their avenue in, and they started holding these protection of Christianity conferences、mm. to the point where now Franklin Graham attends these every year. You know, and 
to a certain extent, Christian evangelicals saw Russia as a natural ally in this global clash of civilizations against Islam in its entirety. And the Russians used that to wedge their way into American conservatism. That and guns. It's a very compelling thesis. And Trump becomes the spokesman for this. Trump becomes elected. There's a little cyber activity that helps him out as well. He is now the president. Now, you're an intelligence analyst by training, and I'm going to assume it's a little bit like journalism at its best, which is you build the thesis, you try and put all the facts together and see what is an effective story that matches this, and then if you're really responsible, you wonder if you're wrong. Sure. You know, that's the pleasure of it and the duty of it is to wonder if you're wrong. What, was, what, makes you, what have you traveled through that makes you think you might be wrong, and what leaves you confident that you're right? Well, this is the difference between journalists and spies. We generally don't think we're wrong at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I to school you a little bit on journalism, friend. No, you think... They don't either. <laughs> See, you think you're wrong. We know we're not. Okay. So... That's very solid, because there have been so many successes. Well... <laughs> Well, usually those successes are by those yeah, failures, the failures are by surface. the consumers of information who never take our advice. Right. Uh, Iraq chemical weapons, for example. I'm learning a lot about your business yeah. here. <laughs> the intelligence community did not say that they had what George Bush said. Okay. So all of that being said, um, what we generally do is we will line up the numbers. And it's a very empirical uh, community. I mean, we don't like people manipulating what we give them. It is what it is, you know, and as the old motto, you know, from the Bible says, the truth so, you know, set you free. After we have analyzed it, done an imagery analysis of it, uh, put signals intelligence onto it, and have actually got a copy of their plans and orders, then the truth will set you free. Mm. Okay. That's the difference between Me. us and <laughs> journalists. So, and then we try to kill somebody at the end of that, you know? In fact, Drew... We only have an hour, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that being said, that's why we came to the community, and myself, my previous book, Plot to Hack America, on the exact same day, turned in the exact same analysis of the Russian hacking. Right. It could only be this. Right. It, now, can we say we have doubts? Yes, and we put those doubts in there and we quantify them. Are they 50%? Are they medium confidence or low confidence? The community came out with high confidence. We kill people with drones on high confidence. No, doubt is high possible. confidence that this occurred, and we don't play games with that. And what we expect is the consumer to now use it in the defense of the United States. I think doubt is ab absolutely necessary if you're going to take reality seriously. Sure. You never know everything. Absolutely. But you would leave your case about Putin in the West and the actions of Trump in a state of confidence, high confidence, near certainty? Where would you put this? I, I personally would put it at very high confidence. Okay. okay? And very high confidence is just not a, a rating that we use <sighs> okay. very often. That means that we have a copy of your plans. Let me just go straight <laughs> to it then. You sensitive types cover your ears. Are we screwed? <laughs> <laughs> We're so screwed. Oh. <laughs> no, but <laughs> there's a bar after the show. <laughs> oh, but, but be of good faith. I yeah. mean, what do you expect the Mueller report, the the indictments so far, and possibly in the future to do to this situation? Well, well let me first characterize our screwedness, as we would, mm. we would probably state of screwedness. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, term of art. We are at a point where where the people who are put into play what they want done for their own personal use, for their family use, and for a strategic adversary who understands that they can now realign the world. And we are literally today, certainly what is Wednesday, when the NATO conference, you are going to see the indicators of the realignment of the world. Yeah. where the poles will move away from the Atlantic Alliance, Washington to the European capitals. You've already had the German foreign minister say, we got to work on plan B. Yeah, well, the plan B is NATO without America. Yeah. Or, and Donald Trump has, I think, the, um, 
to be followed by a tete-a-tete between Putin and Trump. Yeah, well, I mean, he's got to go get counseling after that. So, I mean... <laughs> Your word's not mine. No, I mean, he's got to go in and report into the boss and, and see how things are going. And I don't say that lightly. That's... There, I don't know what the psychology is behind Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump's relationship, but that relationship is a mentor-confidant relationship. Anyone in U.S. intelligence or under the personal responsibility program for atomic weapons would have already been dragged in, polygraphed multiple times, and been considered a potential asset of a foreign agent, agency. Uh, Donald Trump was elected. And this is part of the beauty of the Russian plan. If you want to change the polls in the West, the communists tried to rig elections, but they did it with printing presses and leaflets. It just didn't work. Now you can literally frame the mindset of an entire nation. And they have operational doctrine on how to do that in information warfare to where you think eliminating your constitution by vote it's a good idea. Right. You destroy democracy by using democracy. It's been and done Europe before. has been the test bed for this. Hmm. It has been done before. I do want to end on a more positive note about how we might <laughs> awaken from this nightmare, but we have a healthy inventory of excellent questions from the audience. Um, you probably are still in touch with your old colleagues. Has the quality of the intelligence we're getting from our allies changed? Has it degraded? Do they no longer trust and work with us the same way? Well, I don't know. I wouldn't know at that level. That's, that's a John Brennan kind of question right. who's briefed regularly. And he would Do they trust you. us the same way, though? I think that at a tactical level, uh, operating between Defense Department and at the, the day-to-day level of sharing information about terrorism and general activities as part of our NATO treaties, yes, they treat us the same way. Now, national-level intelligence between national leaders – where Emmanuel Macron may have some information about Vladimir Putin, I don't think that they would share that at all. Hmm. They'll look out for their national interest. Wow. You are listening to the Commonwealth Club of California. Listen to thousands of our podcasts on iTunes or Google Play. And when you're in the Bay Area, please join us live for one of our 450 programs each year. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org. And now, back to our program. So, um, as a long-term PSYOPs guy, how does one counter a bully? How does one deal with the kind of attacks a person like this presents? Which person? <laughs> Are we our talking president. about Putin? Okay, Donald Trump. Our president okay. and his Twitter account. And when you, the funny thing is, PSYOPs doesn't, is not a national internal asset, right? Right. That's a, you know, psychology. Outward projection. Yeah. Right. So that's not the sort of thing that you would find people in the intelligence community doing. But, you know, the FBI has an entire branch of that, all of whom are at the disposal of the special counsel. So this being said, you have a national leader that has now been duly elected. And there was an election and the result did come out the way it came out. Now, the factors that came that at are a completely different animal. We have to understand that the people who are supporting him, that is their base argument, that they have used the legitimate electoral process to choose a leader, and the apathy of 50% of the republic and the strength of the other side, which got 3 million, almost 3 million more votes, did not get those votes in the three precincts where 77,000 more people elected him. And that's just too bad. Yeah, that's the reality. No, well, that's the reality, right? So what do you do? Well, it's simple. You have to do better elections. Now, it sounds simple. No, really. But let me tell you something that, that I understand that Vladimir Putin may have given it advice to the White House. I had this joke in the book that there's a rat in the White House. And rat stood for Russian advisory team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because Donald Trump appears to literally have the checklist of Vladimir Putin and how to solidify a nation into autocracy. And this war on law enforcement, the war on intelligence, definitely the war on the media, trying to buy and co-opt the media... Those things are real, 
and they are happening, and they will undermine American, you know, our constitutional republic. But more importantly, he understands that the kind of people he can mobilize to come out, they don't care about the end result. They care about what he says they should care about. And the thinking electorate, right, can, you know, you're sort of like the population in the, the movie Idiocracy, right? You get outpopulated. Well, in this terms, you've got outgamed. And what they are deathly afraid of is a backlash to that, a national mobilization of the people who voted in the 2016 election and the people who didn't vote in the 2016 election. 120 million people didn't vote who were eligible to vote. What if we brought one additional person to the polls this November in the way that we voted in 2016? Well, there would be more than a landslide. The nation would recalibrate itself to the actual numbers that you see reflected in opinion polls, right? It's almost Th like a recruiting poster, a picture of Putin saying, I want you to be apathetic. Yes, absolutely. And they do. All of these nefarious activities. I want you to feel out on the internet. I have a good friend of mine uh, on the internet who's, who's a well-known uh, Twitter uh, um, author, and she wrote today, she feels, she feels beaten. Yeah. She feels run down. And I have to constantly say, look, this game's only going to get better. Start investing in popcorn stocks. Because what is coming is a, is a point in the nation's history which will truly be historic. You are all living in history. You're talking about the afternoon of the, that Mueller re releases his report? Well, I or think Or something there will be, like it? Or something like it. I, and it may not be the report. It may be the arrest a related to that report. A, some sort the of things which give you right, an indicator as to what kind of freight train is coming. You know, I've heard from people who know Robert Mueller, and one of the little anecdotes they say is, Robert Mueller has one hobby, and that is putting people in prison. Now, you know, I also hear from... They're the on your side, you know. Uh, well, I think they're on America's side, right? All right. So, and, but now the bad news, we are facing, I believe, an existential crisis. I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I would literally sit behind Independence Hall when I felt depressed and think about what these people did to give me a young African-American kid. My family has served in every war since the Civil War because we believe in this American experiment. And it is, unfortunately, now at 243 years, we're going back to the experiment yeah. stage to the point where it could flame out and transition to autocracy. Well, it's going to die of cynicism. Yeah. So well. who would have thought that, you know? Well... Whoever made the movie Idiocracy. Right. right. <laughs> Mike Judge. Mike okay. Judge. Um, another question from the audience. Um, do you feel the electoral system, which is highly <clears throat> networked, is still safe? Or do you feel it's been horribly compromised? No, I think... Voting machines. You know, voting machines and the electoral process at the street level is so diverse, a foreign adversary couldn't hack it. Okay. There's just some precincts use paper ballots, some use punch ballots, some use electronic ballots. Where you really, and, and this is where we saw the Russians playing around, where you really can play with things is through voter suppression by changing the fundamental information on your voter registration. And that, of course, sows chaos as well. 20 to 25 states were scanned by GRU, Russian Military Intelligence, and their voter registration databases were hacked or penetrated in some way, even though there's a lot of denial about that. If you were to put a program in that changed everybody's street address by one digit, on election day, you might get a lot of people who can correct that, but you would suppress millions of votes. So let's say the Russians want to do that this year for fun, okay? But you know what they, I would do if that was them? Especially if it looked like a tsunami year? I would do it to Republicans. Because then you would create the groundswell for civil war. When they lose an election, they thought they should have won. And some activity occurs, and all of Donald Trump's rantings about 
it was Democrats in collusion with Russia could be played as a form of mischief. Uh, that would be the grounds. Well, that would be actually grounds for a lot of action on the street. Uh, we mentioned um, France briefly, mm. but the attempt there was uh, foiled, yes, if you will. It was. And uh, one of the audience members asks, "What happened there that made it largely repelled?" compared to the 2016 U.S. election. Interesting, interesting story about the French elections. Um, in the run-up to the French elections, uh, the Russians, we believe that the Russians had carried out a hacking, very similar to the one done at the DNC, and had taken material from Emmanuel Macron's party servers and had put that information on the dark web where it was, quote-unquote, found by American alt-right activists. Surprisingly, one of them was a now former U.S. Navy cryptologic officer with a top-secret SCI security clearance, and uh, who was also a big Pizzagate uh, scandal guy. Ooh, Just go shows to go, you, you know, Alec, this is Alex Jones world people. But they, quote-unquote, found this data and then created a, a, a link on Twitter, Macron leaks, the day before the French elections. Two things occurred which thwarted this plan. Number one, the French aren't stupid. Okay? They saw the hacking of the Democratic National Committee, and they know Watergate when they see it. Yeah. So working Having with... Having a precedent did help. Yeah, it, it, it yeah. did. The working with French intelligence and the National Security Agency, our cryptologic and, and, and cyber defenders, they set a trap for the Russians by giving them a server that had nothing really on it, except material they put on it that they expected to be stolen. <laughs> and that information was essentially every one of the same, you know, bulletins that they had put out, nothing salacious. But they thought whoever stole it thought it would be like America, and all you had to say was the word emails, and everybody would do it. And again, all, American alt-writers created the Twitter feed to disperse that. The second thing is, France has a blackout in, in the days leading up to the election, and no election-related news can go on the, on the web, on the television, or onto radio. And so after the election, when Macron leaks fizzled, People realized, uh, through actually Admiral Rogers uh, made the announcement, along with the French, that the National Security Agency had set up the people that had stolen this information and that everything in there was false. Uh, and that the, or not false, but was, was uh, part of an, a bait for an ambush. And then we, they started checking to see if the material that was about to be released or was being released was identical to the material that they had put in there. So the trap was sprung. And it just shows, though, the link between Russian intelligence, people who call themselves journalists, and then American activists of the alt-right who will try to interfere with a foreign election. They are now, as, as I like to say from the old Captain America movies, they are like the nefarious organization Hydra, right? Who, who cut one head off, two pop up. And their motto is Hail Hydra or Hail Trump, whichever yeah. one. They may have lost, but they learned, too, and they'll try a different thing. They did. Um, there is a, an interesting and, I think, valid um, equivalence question here. Mm. Okay, the Russians messed with our election. They messed with the French election. The U.S. has a unfortunate history of affecting other countries' elections, suppressing the communists in Italy, installing governments in Guatemala going back to the 50s, Mossadegh and Iran. We could go on. There's right. a, a rich list. Um, so – haven't we done it too? You know, I, I get this question a lot, and they go, oh, and you, all you intelligence guys, or you can't be trusted. Well, you know what? We can't account for American history, but every one of those activities was exposed by our system of government. And we found, look, let's be honest, when the church committee hearings were, were done in the 1970s, we found agencies completely out of control with zero accountability to the U.S. government. And some of those activities were very nefarious, overthrowing regimes, assassinating people, or at least having the potential to assassinate our enemies. That was all brought under control 
uh, after the 1970s. Do we influence elections? Yes, we influence elections. But we influence elections through two major nonprofits that go out and do good work. You know, the, I, I believe it's the National Republican uh, Association and the, the National Democratic Association, which works with activists in these countries to strengthen their elections and strengthen their political party systems. That's good. And American democracy is fundamentally good. And we eliminate the players. What we don't do is go to Los Cruces and find the most virulent of nerve agents ever created in the history of America and go around and poison people in our allies' nations. We don't do that. We don't come in and fundamentally choose a person and decide that that person's going to be our candidate and then craft a meta narrative around an election and then convince the American public that that person is our choice and he's the one that's going to help things so that he can dismantle the entirety of the NATO alliance since 1949. We don't do that. Uh, now, are we better than them? Yes, we're better than them. I'm just, bang. Uh, yeah. Let's make a value judgment. We're better. I'm, yeah, well, yeah. you know. We well, aren't whacking people right and left, rewarding kleptocrats. Not I'm not sure we're in total equipment. We are not here. killing journalists. We are not killing our citizens. We are not going around the world and carrying out chemical weapons terrorist attacks. Do we project power in such a way that people can mistake that as something similar? Yes, we like to drop bombs. But usually we try to drop bombs for good reasons. What we don't do is we don't go out and back strong men today, I won't say that that was never done in American history, who mass murder half a million of their own citizens. And then we don't try to re-engineer the polls of, of the world, except that now I have a president that, which has abandoned democracy who has removed strengthening and fostering democracy from the, from the mission statement of the State Department. All right? For Christ's sake, crying out loud. So, <laughs> poor Thomas Jefferson. Mm. This is rolling over in his grave. So, all of these things are being done in our name. Mm -hmm. And they view that the people, our administration views the people that did these things to our fundamental principles, flawed as they are, are meh, or just whatever. You know, they do not care because they have harnessed power to win power at all costs. And I think Robert Mueller is on the hunt to find those people who have, have fundamentally corrupted American do uh, the American electoral process for their own personal goals. Problem is, there's no do overs written in the Constitution. You're going to have to deal with whatever comes out of this. And I think there will be a lot of people who will be very reluctant to yield power. Yeah, it's almost as if the um, what happens after the reveal will be more grueling than the reveal itself. Yeah, because to cleanse the system, a lot of people are going to have to admit they're wrong. This is not going to, you know, it's not going to be like the, the 37% or 27% that backed Nixon after Watergate. This is, I mean, we have people out there who, I see it on Twitter, my family has received a lot of death threats in the last year. Um, and there are people out there who think the Second Amendment is their amendment, their, their amendment, their right, their ability to resolve differences in political opinion. That is where we are now. The last time people talked like that was the Civil War. I think there's also something else going on, which is insidious, and I'd love your guidance on what we might do about it. You could blame postmodernism, you could blame the internet, you could blame Putin. But there is this mentality that you have your truth and I have my truth. Yeah. And this is a situationalist environment. Trump speaks for me. He's, he is a truth. To, even when he lies, he's telling the truth. Yeah. He's, he's sticking it to people. <laughs> and that's a form of truth. That anger is authentic. And how do we get away from that and back to a commonly agreed reality? <laughs> I won't say you just dumbfounded gotcha me. Corner. No, no. <laughs> okay, a lot of people want to know if there's a tape. Is there, no, is there a no, P-tape? No. Let me answer that question. <laughs> yeah. No, the horribleness of, of your question is something that we should all ponder for. I think that's the true existential reality of where we are. How do we come back to a commonly agreed reality in which we can practice democracy? I pray that 
it will that whatever comes out of the the the, the special counsel's investigation. And I, I've said this on national television. And Chris Matthews, who I love, I, I actually struck silent for one moment. <laughs> When I said a year ago, this nation will enter a Benedict Arnold moment. And I believe... What do you mean by that? I believe that there are people... The initial premise, the initial reason this investigation started was because we had found American citizens through our allied intelligence agencies and our national security apparatus who had been in direct and continuous communication and contact with foreign intelligence agencies in order to engineer an outcome on this election. And I believe that everyone involved in this investigation, no matter how you slice it, Republican, Democrat, I was a Republican most of my life, they are patriots. They go to work and they walk into the bureau or they walk by the statue of Nathan Hale over at the agency or the wall of honor at the, at the NSA selfishly, to keep you safe, but more importantly, to uphold the one principle we all hold deeply in our hearts, and that's our Constitution. And if they find Americans are working to undermine the Constitution, they will not waver in calling that out. And I think we all have to embrace whatever the outcome of this this is. How do we re-engineer the people who will not believe that? You have to bring them back to, 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 to the founding principles. Mm. You have to call them as fellow patriots to say, listen, you know, Washington wouldn't have stood for this. Jefferson wouldn't have stood for this. Hamilton and Lincoln, none of these people would ever have sided with the ex-director of the KGB. Right? You're just going to have, it, it will just be a, a cathartic moment that may end in violence in some quarter. I was going to say, you know, people don't change their minds like that on a beautiful day in the hot sun with a full belly. No. It's, a, it's in a desperate moment that they change their minds like that. Well, and even worse, you have 50% of the country that has to go to work and have kids and, and go to right. Walmart, and they don't care. And they, I, I had someone just recently, a, a young gentleman in a Lowe's. Uh, who was working there, say, I'm sick of this Russia stuff. I'm sick of it. And I said, you're going to be sick of it when we find that people were actually working with another country? Maybe that won't happen. Maybe there's God and he will say, listen, we're going to keep this all together and it's not as bad as it seems and the people who were working with them get get nailed and go to jail because Robert Mueller likes that hobby. Mm. So, but on the other hand, I think a lot of people who have instocked their faith behind Donald Trump's ability to tell them anything and everything, and that every lie from his mouth, now documented about 3,300 per year, <laughs> is the truth. You can't run this nation as a liar. You can't run the, the fundamental guardrails of this country will bring you back. And one way or another, the truth will out. And we have to be there to defend and stand tall and shout that truth when it, comes, when it becomes clear. And I would... Stay ready, stay brave. Very true. Stay ready, stay brave. Um, by the way, I wasn't kidding, and I'm going to stick my neck out here. Um, you four or five people out there, i sorry, I don't think you know if there's a tape. <laughs> I, I will say this, and I wrote a small section of my analysis about Donald Trump's behavior. There's an entire chapter in the book called A Treasonous Aspect. Mm. where I Spoiler ha- alert. Spoiler alert. There could be a tape. Um, well, no, I don't know. But there's something. Yeah. Look, there's like a- basic psychology 101 here, right? Go find a freshman and, and ask them about this. People are motivated by one of two things, a reward or a punishment. Hmm. You have to ask yourself, what does this president see in Vladimir Putin and him going out on a ledge at, from the highest of all heights in the history of the United States to think, I will cover for this man yeah. and his activities and everything he has done to the point where I will compliment him 
and insult every one of America's traditional and very nice allies. In Montana last week, he said he criticized John McCain, made fun of George H.W. Bush, a nonagenarian former president, and criticized NATO and then said there's nothing to worry about about Putin. Like, yeah. why even go there? Yeah, the KGB. You're in Montana. He goes, the KGB, he's fine. He was KGB, he's fine. It's like, that's like a tell, you this know? This kind of like, operant can oper you play cards with this guy and just say KGB and see what he does. Yeah, you know? but this is where, I mean, you know, when I was in the military, I, I was an instructor at the, at the Navy Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape School. And I ran a terrorist and hostage survival program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people talk about Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a defensive reaction to the captivity of being a hostage. Okay? Yeah. This is not Stockholm Syndrome. These people are willfully going into this. And only yeah. someone who's an expert in cults could, could, could explain why... I'll, they will accept any lie, anything that even appears to be, no matter how detached from the truth and reality it is, it is now theirs, and they embrace it. I think when you, when you live in a world where people can manufacture realities and other people will cheer, it gets a lot easier. Well, you know, the Russians have created these meta-narratives yeah. that Donald Trump has absorbed when he went to that two-hour meeting with the Russian oligarchs in 2013 at the Nobu restaurant. He came out spouting anti-NATO, anti-European Union, anti-globalization. Uh, you know, he actually says things, refers to people as globalist, as an insult. Yeah. I mean, we created globalism with World War II, dropping spam all around the world, and American consumer goods and madmen and all that stuff. These people... And the standard of living went up. Yeah, oh, around the world. Yeah, it's really great. They, they have just glom glommed on to these catchphrases. They don't understand. Russia, they use the phrase Atlanticists mm. to be the people who believe in the Washington-European alliance that is, has kept... The world say, well, kept us from a world war since World War II. We are going through a, an, an, an unreality to a certain extent has been manufactured. And you are looking at the finest product the Soviet Union had created and just couldn't execute because the, the speed of transmitting data wasn't perfected until really social mass social media came in and created a, a viral vector for an uh, information framework that is a, they're a, an unnatural construct so that you can surround yourself in and feel good. They can't make cars anybody wants to buy. They can't make soda pop or movies or anything else that export very well. But cynicism, <clears throat> they got that one down. Yeah, Pardon and me. you know, the funny thing is people say, well, Malcolm, that's fascinating and it sounds crazy. And I say, yeah, well, you know, this was written down by the Russians. They don't just, you know, they have formulated this, creating meta-narratives and new realities for you to absorb through social media into their strategic military doctrine. And I actually have a quote here uh, from a, a book called, a Ukrainian study called Fog of War, Russian Strategy of Deception in the Conflict in the Ukraine. And it says... The stages of shaping a perception management campaign around an opponent after applying force or in peacetime a lack of force can be achieved in four major stages. One, by assisting the opponent's formulation of an appreciation of the initial situation. So in other words, they will give you their opinion of how the world is. Let's say Russia justifiably invaded Crimea because everybody there speaks Russian. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? No. Yeah, because the President of the United States just a couple of weeks ago, when trapped with a question, pulled out of his mind on the fly that statement. Those words were the official policy of the Kremlin to justify that invasion. It was put into his head in meetings with Russians and when caught because he's not a great deep thinker <laughs> that initial formulation popped to the top of his head and he let it come out of his mouth number two shaping an opponent's objectives number three shaping the opponent's decision-making algorithm and four by the the choice of the decision-making moment in other words when you create 
a framework of information around your opponent. No matter what he does, go left, go right, if you can get into his initial decision-making chain, like running for president of the United States, which we know now, due to Konstantin Rykov, the, the owner of Channel One in Russia, Putin's, um, Putin's uh, uh, propagandist, Donald Trump tweeted to him in 2012 that, he, that he, he thinks that he should run for president. And Rykov actually DM'd him and you, as you guys know on Twitter, you have to be friends yeah. to direct message each other. He said, how can we in Russia help you? That occurred the night that Mitt Romney lost to Barack Obama. One week later, he organized Make America Great Again Pact, so, PAC, Political Action Committee. This did not happen in 2015. This was decided in 2012. One year later, the Russian Internet Research Agency is established. Donald Trump is meeting with the Russian oligarchs. And again, they shaped his decision-making algorithm, everything from there. It appeared Russians knew Donald Trump was running for president to the point where he was telling people, oh, Donald, if, you, know, you would make a great president, and he would drop these hints. America didn't know till 2015, three years later. They created his framework. He is operating within it, and that's why he's going to go to the NATO summit. At the least, he might be neutral. At the worst, he may start thinking that America needs to start breaking things up. And Moscow would be quite pleased. And there are, but there are numerous actors around him. Sure. You could count his children, whatever. Oh, but yeah. Senators, congressmen who have helped him, um, people like Manafort and Cohen, um, what is motivating them? I mean, there is m many reasons. It may just be money. It may be they're, at this point they're afraid of getting whacked like people in the U.K. or people in the steel, people who contributed to the steel report were. What do you think is that, why would a senator, presumably a, a patriotic individual, um, you know, yeah. sign off on this? It's a really good question. Because early on, last year when I was having discussions with some of my peers, um, and after I had written Plot to Hack America, which was the, the prequel to the Plot to Destroy Democracy, you know, you have to ask yourself, why would Jeff Sessions have meetings with the Russians that he would lie about? Hmm. No, lie. When confronted, he would say, that never happened. That's not... No, Turned that's out not, they got a picture of yeah, it. Yeah, well, that's not co-option by an intelligence agency. That's a choice. Right? That's a personal choice. And in this world, if there's any one thing I know, and you have to remember, I worked at the National Security Agency, and I'll, I'll tell you a little spy story. We had a guy who worked at NSA uh, who sold out a multi-billion dollar special operation for $36,000. $36,000, to the point where one of the floors had to be completely torn apart and rearranged because the Russians knew everything about it. They knew every workstation, who worked there. All of us got repolygraphed. So, And he got you, it for the, they gave him a Class C Mercedes, right? Yeah, or something like Low that. Low-end Lexus. Yeah, he's, he's it's <laughs> utterly amazing what people will sell their country Kind of mispriced himself, didn't he? Yeah, well, and he wanted to pay, you know, his taxes. So, <laughs> you, there is, if, let me just quote one of the greatest philosophers in the world, and that's the band ABBA. <laughs> money, money, money <laughs> must be funny in a rich man's world. Yeah. That is the only thing that in our community we can explain. it. It's not ideology. It's not about bringing together a great arc of American conservative Christianity and Russian conservative Christianity, though there are people who back that. It is not about fulfilling Samuel Huntington's and Osama bin Laden's clash of civilizations between Islam and Christian world. There are some people who believe in that. There has to be a pot of money out there that is so big that people would think, I will get through my time in this administration, use my time in this administration, and go out and collect my reward. Money that and is it's close, all it could be. And it's close buddy power. Well, I mean, we're talking about money that exceeds power because it now manipulates nations. Yeah. You know, Bond villain stuff. Whoa. Um, 
Let me, uh, we have time for one more question. Sure. I wish we had more. Um, let me ask, about 100 years ago, this Irish writer said, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. You're saying history is something we need to wake up back into. The nightmare is the, the absence of history or an unwillingness to admit history. Um, how are we going to do that? How are you personally going to do that? How should people in this room do that? What can we say to people who don't believe this is going on? What should we do? You know, I, I fundamentally think that we all, to a certain extent, certainly any, anyone who's listening to this and, and who's in this room, that we are all lovers of history. Because, and, and that... that the average person out there who believes in the 4th of July and, you know, the flags and the parades and, you know, misquotes the Star Spangled Banner. That, <laughs> no, but they understand the, the fabric that we come from. They understand the, the clay that molded this nation. And I think that we have to bring them back to that. I, get, I argue all the time o online, and, and I get people who confront me all the time, and they're like, well, Trump, Trump, Trump. And I go, okay, awesome. You know? And they go, well, Barack Obama was blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, but he wasn't backed by the ex-director of the KGB. <laughs> and, they, and then I have to explain what the KGB is. So, no, really, we are in a period of American history where it is time for us all to embrace the the core precepts of what this nation was built on. We are living history. I, have, have anybody here seen Hamilton, the musical? That is a motivating weapon system. I will tell you, if I had to use a psychological operations tool, I would make Hamilton into a movie today, right? Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I would it's forget about the $500 tickets, and I would yeah. make sure that it was dispersed all across the nation for free to understand just what the stakes were. Where I grew up in Philadelphia, when I go to Fifth and Chestnut and I feel sad about what's happening, I understand that I am the legacy defender, both which I did with my life and my family's life, and my father's life. My niece was in combat off of Yemen last year against Iranian anti-shipping missiles. We defend this, and we believe that this fundamental foundation of this nation m was built on the lives and the risk to the lives and the treasure of the men that walked into the building that would be to my right at Independence Square and said, we could die from doing what we're about to do. Right now, we are at a point in American history where I think we are all going to have to make that decision to defend this. And I, I say in my book, we have to adopt the motto of the United States Army. This I will defend. Now, you may not, it's, look, you're not going to be defending it at Whole Foods, okay? <laughs> There's not going to be a civil war, per se. But we are in an ideological war where half the country is apathetic. One third of it really are misguided. Vlad wants you to be cynical. Yeah, Vladimir Putin wants you to be cynical. But the fabric of America is under attack. And now is the time for each of you to embrace that feeling that you are within history. History has its eyes on you. Because as I quoted from Hamilton, which I do a lot, in the last epilogue of my book, there's that scene where George Washington comes on the scene and, and Hamilton is waiting for his hero. And Washington's words are, we are outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned. We've got to make an all-out stand. And that's where we are. We are outgunned. They have done something which has never been done in the history of the United States. They have called into question whether we even believe what we are or who we are. Are you going to take that lying down or are you going to mobilize and stand for it? I know what my choice is. I will risk my family, my life, and my treasure for this nation.
I tend to like to end on an optimistic note, <laughs> but I have never seen it framed as a political act, as an existential act, and as a somewhat subversive act against the dominant paradigm. I really thank you for that. <laughs> Our thanks to Malcolm Nance, author of his new book, The Plot to Destroy Democracy. You say your book title again so people get it. The Plot to Destroy Democracy, How Putin and His Spies Are Undermining America and Dismantling the West. Thank you for joining us this evening. My pleasure. I'm Quentin Hardy, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. That was fantastic. That was fun. I enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs>